If there is one message that I would like you to take home today, it is that research is important for a church that is intentional about living and growing and being relevant in the contemporary world. Research can often challenge and confront us. It can help us to look at ourselves, our identity and our behavior in new ways. It can lead us in unexpected directions. But research always starts with a question. And here's where I tell you a bit of my personal history in that for the past 11 years, I've been living in the United States where uh, my husband and I have been working a lot as volunteers with low income and homeless women. And I found myself becoming more and more angry about the policies of the Tea Party in the US and, and wondering how could they become so convinced of their position that they could call themselves Christians? Why could they not see that their policies had harmful implications? And why was I becoming so incensed that I was losing my perspective? In short, I was becoming radicalized without even realizing it. How could I, a well-educated, rational human being, have let this happen? Around the time that we left Australia, I was also observing a similar phenomenon happen within the Lutheran Church of Australia around the question of the ordination of women and the authority of scripture. As time progressed, parties on both sides were becoming more entrenched in their position and each more convinced of their righteousness. It seemed to me that this church, which I deeply love, was moving disturbingly close to schism. Again, how could this happen? How could good people who hold to the same beliefs become so divided? And why was this division associated on each side with such strong emotions? Why did arguing with each other using reasoned logic, theology and scripture not change opinion? In fact, why did this common and instinctive approach have an effect that seemed quite opposite? So my fundamental question that I'm posing today is this, what causes people to radicalize? During the course of my research, which I've been working on for over the last four years about religious radicalization and its causes, there are a couple of conclusions that I've come to. One is that when individuals within a religious group radicalize or a religious group moves towards schism, it's not about doctrine or religion. It's about morality. And I'll explain more about what I mean by morality in a moment. And fundamentalism or a shift towards conservative values is triggered by a fear of loss of the sacred. Now these are opinions that can be uh, challenged by other people and others are in fact challenged by other scholars who all believe that religion lies at the heart of religious conflict. So what I'm arguing today is that it's about the brain and not about the content of the beliefs. So I'm going to go through some of my methodological presuppositions which are that a religious movement, denomination or sect is a social group. Religious groups are not special in this sense of being a social group. They form and behave in the same ways as other social groups. Morality is the primary force that binds social groups together. And by morality, I mean functional morality, the values we operate by without thinking, not ethics, the values that we aspire to. So what I'm really talking about is what's summed up by the Apostle Paul in the passage Romans 7:19, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I persist in doing. What we're talking about here is the tension between what in Lutheran circles uh, or in Christian circles we would call sin and say deification or divinization in the Orthodox Christian world, between sin and sanctification in the Catholic Church, or, as Lutherans, we talk about being simultaneously both saint and sinner, 100% of both, all the time. What I'm essentially talking about is why good people do bad things for good reasons. So this brings us to part two of my talk, and the brain and morality. So the important thing to know, and this is in effect kind of counterintuitive for us in many ways, is that the brain works on a dual processing uh, model. 
So our cognitive activities fall into two basic types, effortful, deliberative, and conscious, what we call reason, and automatic, intuitive, and non-conscious, or pre-conscious, what we call intuition. So the two most fundamental insights that relates very specifically to the domain of morality, and we could argue at length about how reason and intuition interact in the way people make judgments and when they, how they think about different things. And in fact, in other way, uh, areas other than morality, they do interact in completely different ways. But in the one area of morality, what most of the neurosciences now agree on is uh, points one and three, which is that morality is largely universal, that is, it's cross-cultural, and that all decision processes, and this is the most important one, that result in our behaviours, regardless of category, are carried out before conscious awareness of them. So they result from a microsecond gut intuitive instinctive reaction. So this is only in the area of morality, but it's not about reason, it's all about gut instinct. And in fact, this brings us to what Jonathan Haidt, one of the premier um, researchers in the area of moral psychology calls the emotional dog and its rational tail. So we always reason about the decision, instinctive decision we've made after the fact. What Joshua Green talks about in terms of morality and what, how this relates then to the way groups work is that morality binds and blinds. So groups share some core values each group's philosophy is woven into its daily life. Each group has its own version of moral common sense. They fight not because they are immoral, but because when they come into competition, they view the contested ground from very different moral perspectives. As one reviewer said of Joshua Green's book, Moral Tribes, what you're saying is that from an evolutionary perspective, morality is built to make groups cohere not to achieve world peace. And this is one reason why, no matter how much we desire to achieve peace or to unite groups together, the default position is really about splitting. It's actually much harder to bind people together. You can bind individual groups. When you want larger groups to come together, it gets quite difficult. This is because morality binds us into ideological teams that fight each other as though the fate of the world depended on our side winning each battle. It blinds us to the fact that each team is composed of good people who have something important to say. Now this is fundamentally a whole field of research called moral foundations theory. And Jonathan Haidt uh, and his colleagues, uh, some of the key researchers in this field. Uh, and there's also a very interesting article there by Ryan McKay and Harvey Whitehouse who are from Oxford University that uh, brings together that whole uh, area of research with religion in particular. So what we're moving on to is moral intuitions or foundations. So what Jonathan Haidt and his group have identified are five fundamental group uh, moral foundations. The first is care slash harm. The second is fairness slash cheating. The third is loyalty slash betrayal. The fourth is authority subversion. And the fifth is sanctity degradation. You'll see that in the table that they provide, each of these is in response to an uh, evolutionary um, adaptive challenge. So care harm, for instance, is all about protecting and caring the for the vulnerable members of a non-kin group. So specifically about caring for children. And fairness and cheating is, is how you end up in a relationship where the whole group can get on with each other without somebody dominating or having an unfair advantage over the rest. So that's, that whole concept grew out of that. So these have original triggers. You'll see the original triggers there. They also, very importantly, have characteristic emotions that are linked to those intuitions or foundations. One of the most important uh, for religious conflict research, I think, is that fifth category where most of the sanctity degradation uh, concepts are triggered around an emotion of disgust. And we'll also talk a little bit about uh, loyalty betrayal later and also about the anger that comes out of having your fairness um, foundation triggered. Most of us will find that we get very angry very, very quickly when we think something is unfair. However, what we perceive as fair 
or unfair may in fact be different from what someone else will see as fair or unfair. And a lot of this depends on how you filter it through these foundations. So to talk about these moral foundations, what Jonathan Haidt argues is that it fundamentally causes groups to bind in two specific ways. So that number one and two, and bearing in mind that this is not hierarchical, it's just how he's described them. Number one and two, care and, and fairness, are individualizing foundations which generate virtues and practices that protect individuals from each other and allow them to live in harmony as autonomous agents who can focus on their own goals. And he calls this the contractual approach. Three and to five are fundamentally binding foundations because the virtues, practices and institutions they generate function to bind people together into hierarchically organized interdependent social groups that try to regulate the daily lives and personal habits of their members. And he calls this the hive approach. So in the hive approach, the group and its territory are the fundamental units of value. Individuals come and go, but the hive lives for a long time and each individual has a role to play in fostering its success. The two fundamental problems of social life are attacks from outside and subversion from within. So either can lead to the death of the hive, so all must pull together, do their duty, be willing to make sacrifices for the group. The goal is a world not of individual freedom, but order and tradition in which people are united by a shared moral code that is effectively enforced, allowing people to trust each other and play their interdependent roles. Now, as I argued when I, uh, this hive approach is fundamentally what underwrites all forms of institutional religion. So uh, Christianity, most forms of Christianity are essentially a hive approach. And in fact, in the recent uh, Royal Commission on uh, Child Abuse, we heard the Catholic archbishops expressing precisely this, that uh, Mark Coleridge in particular said, we place too much emphasis on the institution and not enough on the individual. So the hybrid approach can be a good thing. A lot of societies around the world operate on this model or, or on these foundations to, to bind themselves together as political entities uh, nations like India, where Jonathan Haidt did his primary research. However, it, it can skew into, if there's too much emphasis on those high foundations, into a situation where things become highly problematic. The contractual approach. In this approach, the individual is the, fu the, individual is the fundamental unit of value, not the group. Individuals often hurt each other, so we create implicit social contracts and explicit laws to foster a fair, free and safe society that allows individual freedom. The goal is maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering. Let people make their own choices as long as they harm nobody else. So in this we can see what fundamentally um, political theorists of liberal democracies would argue is the, the principles that uh, underwrite their understanding of what uh, liberal democratic freedom is about. It's about people living together in ways that enable to them to cooperate, but that doesn't compromise their personal freedom. What's interesting is that Haidt, in fact, uh, copped a lot of flack from the political theorists when he proposed that, in fact, they also operate on the Hive foundations as well, without understanding that they're also operating on those foundations. Uh, and, and so they were trying to argue that, no, no, we only operate from the fairness and justice side of things. Um, and his argument is, in fact, that political theorists, if they want to understand how nations work as entities, have to take those other foundations into account. So what we're going to do is move on to how these foundations can underwrite, or these models of group binding can underwrite uh, how we understand ourselves as church, so ecclesiology. So one of my colleagues at ACU last year wrote an article uh, analyzing the, the ecclesiologies of the last three popes in the Catholic Church. What he wrote was, and, and this is without understanding moral foundations theory at all, but I find his, his descriptions extremely illustrative. So he says, a major aspect of the strategy of re-evangelization under John Paul II and Benedict XVI has been the strong assertion of a distinctive Catholic identity, one which reasserts its liturgical and religious cultural aspects, such as forms of piety and religious observance in the face of the desacralizing power of secularity. 
So this is popes responding to the threat of secularism, again, a fear of the loss of the sacred. Benedict in particular placed a strong emphasis on the role of the liturgy, lifting restrictions on the use of the Latin mass and returning on occasion to the pre-Vatican II practice of facing the altar while celebrating the mass. At least in English-speaking countries, these moves were accompanied by the introduction of a new translation of the mass, which sought to re-sacralize liturgical language, adding an aesthetic dimension that had supposedly been lost in the translation post-Vatican II. A key strategy of the new evangelization was to attract people to the church through the beauty of its liturgical celebrations. At the same time, however, there was debate over the notion of the smaller, purer church, a more devout, more religiously intense, more loyal band who would carry the church into the future. And we'll say more about the idea of loyalty and smaller bands in a moment. Outside of the first world countries, such as Europe and the US, the picture of Catholicism, this is Neil Ormerod arguing again, is very different. Numbers are growing and the main opponent, so to speak, are not secularism or atheism, but Pentecostals and evangelicals, siphoning off Catholics into their burgeoning communities. Religion is far from being on the wane in the two-thirds world of the South. The election of a new Pope from the global South, Pope Francis, has brought a different vision for the future of the Church, one less tied to European forms and culture, less constrained liturgically, and more engaged with social issues around poverty and injustice. These issues, deemed peripheral by those opposed to secularization, are now back into central focus for a new pontificate. Francis is committed to a church that goes out to the margins, that does not wait for the world to come to it, but reaches out to the world with the gospel message. The undoubted impact of the new papacy is evidence of a church constantly able to renew and revitalize itself through a focus on its gospel mission. Now, when we look at both of these ecclesiologies, A and B, and again, uh, this is Neil Ormerod summarizing, I think we can see how these fit into this hivist mentality on one side and contractual um, model on the other. So ecclesiology A, this is Pope Benedict XVI and John Paul II. In terms of an ecclesial program, the church then has two options either sectarian withdrawal from the secular world in order to maintain its identity unsullied by contact with the world, or to subsume the secular within itself and thus sacralize it in a return to the idealized past of Christendom. Ecclesiology B, in this vision, concern for the kingdom and working for its realization transcend the boundaries of the church. They are the concern of everyone because evil in all its forms both outside and inside the church, affect everyone, personally, culturally, and socially. This focus on the kingdom rather than the church moves the church beyond itself. And in the process, the church's identity is transformed, taking on new social and cultural forms as it engages in its mission. It is also a vision that invites and even requires collaboration with those outside the church because the church of itself does not claim to have the only resources to bring, the, bring to bear on the problem of evil. There are, of course, risks to such a mission-oriented strategy, risks that the identity of the church may be weakened, distorted, or otherwise compromised. Certainly, it is possible to identify situations and contexts where this weakening of identity may be said to have occurred. However, if the alternative is sectarian stagnation, and irrelevance to those outside the church, then the risks may be worth taking. So in the one model, the hive model tends to contract people in on themselves and away from other groups and contamination. The contractualist model is one that tends to look outwards because it's all right to be in a contractual relationship with other people. So there are behavioral consequences of the way these intuitions inform the way groups bind together. What's interesting is the next piece from an article that jo Jesse Graham and Jonathan Haidt wrote at the same time as their book on um, uh, religious, uh, uh, that came out in 2012. So what they're talking about here is that evil, and we heard about evil in the previous uh, ecclesiologies, evil is whatever stands in the way of sacredness, 
So again, it's about fear of loss of the sacred. Evil emerges as communities construct ideological narratives and converge on a shared understanding of what their problems are, who caused them, and how to fight back. Ideological narratives, by their very nature, are always stories about good and evil. They identify heroes and villains, they explain how the villains got the upper hand, and they lay out or justify the means by which, if we can just come together and fight hard enough, we can vanquish the villains and return the world to its balanced or proper state. And I have to say, when I read this, I was sitting there thinking like, I've been there and I've done that, and it's really embarrassing, in fact, to recognize this in yourself, that people may or may not be good or evil, but you tend to put them into those camps as part of these ideological narratives. So sacredness, to continue, refers to the human tendency to invest people, places, times, and ideas with importance far beyond the utility they possess. Trade-offs or compromises involving what is sacralized are resisted or refused. In prototypical cases, trade-offs or compromises are felt to be acts of betrayal. And so this is why we hold up the inability to move from a particular position or, or, or that we cannot move from a particular position because that's a betrayal of what we hold sacred. And this, I think, is quite um, active in the debates at the moment around the authority of scripture. And in fact, it's, I think, telling that when you look back over the history of the Lutheran Church in Australia, debates about the authority of scripture have arisen and become particularly virulent at the same time as there has been a fear of change. So at the time of the union between the two synods in the 1960s, in the 1980s, when we started raising the issue of women voting in synods, and now in the present day, when we raise the issue of women and uh, uh, possibly becoming pastors. So we're going to talk now about language in the brain. So this is where the part about where language comes in and why language is important. So what we're talking about is uh, an area of research called cognitive linguistics and particularly conceptual metaphor theory. And this is because what has been recognized over the last 30 years now is that we fundamentally think in metaphoric ways. So we, what we do is we map abstract ideas and make sense of the world around us that uh, makes sense of abstract ideas by mapping them onto experiential things that we learn from childhood and from our daily life. So there's a reason why concepts like time are, are related to movement, why time flows or it moves forward or it moves backwards or it stands still. And most of our other um, concepts that we use to think with or metaphors that we use to think with operate in this way. So I mentioned especially that um, they're often experiential from learned in childhood because our brain is embodied. So moral conceptual metaphors in particular are experiential and tend to be very, very basic and very uh, cross-cultural. So you will find that there is a whole family of moral conceptual metaphors that are found in almost every language group across the world. And in fact, they've also identified them in sign language and uh, in gestures even that people make, uh, which is very interesting. And there is other research too about things like um, how even temperature can relate, uh, can influence how you think, make moral judgments. So if you're holding a warm cup and asked to make moral judgments about a particular scenario, you're more likely to be compassionate or make a more positive moral evaluation. If you're holding a cup of coffee in your hand, then uh, a cup of a, a glass of cold water, then you'll make a more negative judgment. The same as in experiments they've done uh, showing ranking people on a screen um, or asking people, giving them a list and asking them to rank. Uh, moral kind of who's better and who's worse, uh, they would find that if it's towards the top, they get a very positive or more, more positive evaluation. If it's towards the bottom, they get a less positive evaluation. So these are about metaphors like that morality is up, immorality is down, for instance. One of the fundamental things we need to know, however, in terms of how language can feed into intractable positions in conflicts is that every time a concept is triggered in the brain, it, um, it causes a repeated activation of, this, of a particular neural circuit. So the more you activate it in the brain, the more that circuit is triggered, the more it becomes entrenched. And the more deeply entrenched a circuit, 
the more resistant it is to change. And this is all about neural plasticity, and I could say a lot more about that as well. So language plays a really key role in which uh, circuits in the brain are triggered and which are not triggered much. So basically, what we need to know is that the more the same language activates a particular pattern of thought, and again, it also relates to the moral foundations, the more convicted an individual becomes of the associated belief or opinion. And in some ways, it's kind of fascinating because often people who are on intractable sides of a, of a conflict, one of their fears is that, uh, that somehow by talking to the other person, they will have their opinion changed. The reality is that people on both sides, once you've got to that fairly strongly radicalized position in a conflict, neither side is going to be changing and no one's going to really be changing your opinion. So this idea of the slippery slope or other metaphors that make you afraid of associating with people are actually quite false in reality. So what we're going to look at is a very key uh, conceptual metaphor and moral, uh, it's not a moral metaphor, but we'll talk about a moral metaphor that links with it in a moment. So the idea that the church is a body. So we talk in scripture about the body of Christ and we talk theologically about the body of Christ. It's a wonderful metaphor. It's all about, we're all one in the body of Christ. It's about union. But what happens is when we tie it into a moral conceptual metaphor, morality is health, immorality is disease, or also morality is uh, purity, immorality is rottenness. What happens is it starts to take on a rather problematic um, tone. So what it does is it links into this or triggers this morality foundation, which is about sanctity degradation. So if you remember, this was about avoiding contamination. That was the original reason why this was triggered. What happens is that it can then move very rapidly from a literal avoidance of contamination to a symbolic uh, avoidance of symbolic contamination. So if we talk about, for instance, the Crusader period in uh, Antioch and Syria, what happened there was, uh, and there are fascinating articles about this, the Arab Muslims very rapidly talked about these unclean Christians, impure Christians, and we see this same rhetoric turning up in IS literature today. The idea that the infidel, uh, the unbeliever, is somehow unclean and impure and you should avoid uh, association with them. It's because the Norman uh, Crusaders were medieval Christians. They didn't wash, literally. Uh, they did it about twice a year. Whereas the Arab Muslims had come up through um, Greco-Roman Syria where they'd inherited a system of bathing, where they bathed every single day in a very complex way. Um, cleanliness was very important to them. It then became part of their ritual system. And so for them, Christians became equated with impurity and uncleanliness. And so they were literally fighting the Christians, but they also then conceptually started framing them in their own minds as these impure dogs or infidels that they shouldn't associate with. The reality was that there were some Christians who had become normalized within that community. And in fact, as a result of the Arab conquest in the 600s, there were still Christians living in cities like Antioch in Syria and who, who bathed just like every other Arab Muslim uh, and were happy neighbors with them. But what you do is you take the outsider, you frame them in a particular way, and then this has these behavioral consequences. One of my con uh, colleagues, Eric Fournier, has written a wonderful um, article about amputation metaphors, where he shows that in fact, what happens in the fourth century or so is that when you say that heretics are somehow contaminating or a disease, you start wanting to amputate them all the time from the church. So what you're doing is you're cutting them off and sending them into exile. And the language of the church councils of the fourth century is actually rife with language of amputation and um, trying to deal with these diseased individuals uh, who are polluting people. And also uh, in the Old Testament, we find that these concepts are very, very long standing. So a colleague at the University of Haifa, Yitzhak Feder, has been working extensively on this, showing how this works in uh, Jewish ideas uh, in the Hebrew scriptures and how this goes way back into Near Eastern uh, religious sensibilities. So Christianity has inherited these ideas of purity and pollution and the language that goes with them and it sits or it goes all the way through into our scriptures to the present day. So let's look at one more metaphor 
uh, conceptual metaphor, the idea that the church is a family. So this is another common one that we talk about. And we talk in particular about God the Father and Christ the Son. And we do this when we talk about the Trinity. So among the conceptual moral metaphors that are really fundamental and basic, these are a whole number of them. We talked about morality being upright and immorality being low. There's also that morality is light and immorality is darkness. It's why we always talk about the forces of light and the forces of dark, very Star Wars. Uh, we talk about purity and rottenness, strength and weakness, which, which actually plays a very strong role in the hivest uh, uh, kind of mentality. And uh, beauty and ugliness, all of these things that cause problems uh, when you actually operate by them as opposed to just thinking them in terms of how we uh, relate to other people. One of the reasons why placing too much emphasis on God the Father in the Trinity can be problematic is because there is a whole family of metaphors that sit around a metaphoric system in its idealized form called strict father morality and one uh, called the opposite is nurturant parent me mentality. One is fundamentally hivist, the other is fun fundamentally contractualist. One can result in a mentality that leads to retributive justice, the other towards restorative justice. And the reality, and this question came up, uh, was that, but God, when you talk about God the Father, God can be a loving Father, and that's very true. But what you think you're saying and what can be triggered in the brain of your listener can be two different things. And if they already have a strong binding towards the highest uh, intuitions or foundations, they're more likely to be tapping into the idea of God as a strict father, which is really about law, as opposed to God as a nurtured parent, which is about gospel. So, and in particular, what it can do is uh, tap into this uh, intuition of authority subversion, subversion and the idea of hierarchy. So one of the best ways around this that I've seen or heard was the Dean of the Greek Orthodox College in Sydney giving a paper about perichoresis, which in Greek is dancing around. So in which the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are seen to be or conceptualized as literally dancing, flowing around each other, which completely avoids any concept of hierarchy. And it also restores uh, what happens problematically with the overemphasis on the Father which is, and the Son is that you completely obscure the Holy Spirit. But in perichoresis or the conceptualization of the Spirit, it, of the personals of the Trinity, in this more contractual way, uh, you end up with everybody being in, fo or all of the persons being in clear focus. So that brings us to our conclusions. So firstly, this particular body of research suggests that the language we use matters and it matters a lot. What we say can trigger all sorts of intuitions in people's brains that we don't understand that we're triggering. And so we need to be very careful and um, I would say that fundamentally we need to be emphasizing as much as possible in our language, language around care and harm because it's all about the consequences of the actions of these conceptualizations in people's brains. Secondly, it suggests that within religious groups, a shift towards fundamentalism and appeal to the authority of scripture or tradition in response to perceived threat of loss of the sacred are, from a social functionalist perspective, perfectly moral, justifiable, and natural. This is about good people um, who do things for good reasons. We could even say that they are inevitable. Thirdly, the science of moral cognition offers helpful explanations for what has previously, previously been inexplicable on logical or rational grounds, most especially why a religious group that places emphasis on progressive values finds it difficult to talk to and understand the internal logic of a religious group that places emphasis on conservative values and vice versa. It's because you're talking from completely different positions and you're not even talking, if, even if you talk the same language, what each group is saying with that language is completely different. So the fact that the position of both groups is, from their own point of view and in reality, perfectly moral, makes the disconnect understandable. And when we look at the situation in this way, the question then shifts from whether the position of each group is right or wrong, since both are right. 
to whether the behavioural consequences of that position can, in any objective way, be assessed as beneficial or harmful. And this is where I would argue that it's the actions that result that matter and where we need to say it's time that we step back and look at the language that we're using and we need to reframe things so that uh, these intuitions are not being reinforced all the time if they're leading to behavioural consequences that are problematic. Finally, this research warns us not to be blind to the goodness in people who hold a position that we see as oppositional. In many ways, it is a lesson in humility and self-examination. What this research strongly suggests is that self-righteousness is a trap into which the religious progressive is as prone to fall as the religious conservative or fundamentalist. In the end, it brings us back to this scriptural passage from Paul in Romans, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I persist in doing. The good news is that we have forgiveness and we have grace, so we can overcome this. But this does explain why, no matter what we intend, we keep doing it. Thank you.